The Horses of Abdera Leopoldo Lugones By the Aegean Sea lay the Thracian city of Abdera, which is now called Balastra, and must not be confused with its Andalusian namesake, and which was famous for its horses. In Thrace, to win distinction for horses was no mean achievement, and Abdera's reputation in this regard was unsurpassed. Each and every citizen took great pride in the care and rearing of these noble creatures, and their devotion to horses, carefully nurtured over many years until it had grown into a deeply rooted tradition, had led to wonderful results. The horses of Abdera commanded extraordinary prestige, and all the Thracian people from Sicilia to Bisalta paid a special tax to the Bithynians, the conquerors of Abdera. Moreover, the business of horse-rearing, a joy as well as a trade, occupied everyone, from the king down to the lowliest citizen. This great tradition drew horse and master together much more closely than elsewhere in Thrace. The stable came to be regarded as a natural extension of the home, even, since enthusiasm leads to understandable excess, to the extent of allowing the horses to eat at table with their owners. They were truly remarkable steeds, and the manner of their treatment might make one forget that they were beasts at all. Some slept under fine linen bed covers, and since not a few veterinarians maintained that the equine race displayed artistic taste, others had the walls of their stalls decorated with simple frescoes, whilst in the horse's cemetery there were two or three real masterpieces among the conventionally over-elaborate gravestones. Abdera's most beautiful temple was dedicated to Orion, the horse that Neptune conjured from the ground with a single blow of his trident. And I believe that the current practice of carving a ship's prow in the shape of a horse's head derives from the temple decorations. In any event, the most common architectural decorations were the equestrian bas-reliefs. It was the king who showed the greatest devotion to horses, but his leniency towards his own steed's mischief turned them into particularly ferocious creatures, so much so that Podargos and Flash of Light became names in dark and terrible legends, for it should be added that horses were given human names. But on the whole, the horses of Abdera were so well trained that bridles were unnecessary and were used only for adornment, a practice greatly appreciated by the horses themselves. The usual method of communication with them was by the spoken word, and since it had been found that complete freedom from all constraint brought out their best qualities, they were left to roam freely to feed and frolic in the lush meadows reserved for them on the outskirts of the city, on the banks of the river Cosonides, except when they needed to be saddled or harnessed. A horn was then sounded to summon them in, and they were always extremely punctual, whether it was for work or for feeding. Their skill in all manner of circus tricks, even in parlor games, their bravery in combat, their self-possession during formal ceremonies, all defied credulity. The Hippodrome at Abdera thus became renowned not only for its troops of acrobats, but also for its bronze-armored teams of horses and for its ceremonial funerals, so that people came from far and near to wonder at the excellence of the trainers and horses alike. This practice of nurturing horses, cultivating and idealizing their qualities, in short, this humanizing of the equine race, gradually brought about something on which the Bithynians gloated as another glorious national achievement. The intelligence of the animals began to develop, as did their moral conscience. But this also led to some instances of rather curious behavior, which aroused much public debate. A mare demanded mirrors in her stall. She tore them off the walls of her master's bedroom with her teeth, and when he protested she kicked them to pieces. When her whim was finally indulged, she became visibly coquettish. Another instance, Balios, the finest horse in the district, an elegant and high-strung white colt who had survived two military campaigns and who thrilled at the sound of heroic hexameters, died of a broken heart. He had been stricken with love for the wife of his master, the general, and the lady made no attempt to disguise what had happened. It was whispered that his bizarre affair gratified her vanity. 
things of this sort occurred frequently in the capital. There were also cases of equine infanticide, which increased at such an alarming rate that they had to be forestalled by giving the foals to old motherly mules. The horses developed tastes for fish and for hemp, and they raided the hemp plantations. They also began to rebel against their masters in a number of scattered outbreaks, and had to be quelled with burning irons, whips proving inadequate. This stern punishment was employed more and more as the horses became increasingly restless, despite all attempts to discipline them. But these were half-hearted at best, for the Bithynians were besotted with their horses and took no heed of the growing unrest. Soon there were more significant occurrences. Two or three teams of horses banded together to attack a carter who had flogged an unruly mare. The horses began to resist being harnessed and yoked, and donkeys started to be used in their place. Some horses would not be saddled at all, but their wealthy owners still took no action, dismissing it with a laugh as a passing mood. On a certain day the horses ignored the sound of the horn, and their owners had to go and round them up from the meadows. But the rebellion did not break out at once. It erupted later, when the tide had covered the beach with stranded fishes, as had often happened before. On this day, however, the horses gorged themselves on the fishes, and then were seen ambling slowly and menacingly back towards the open meadows in the suburbs of the city. The conflict first broke out at midnight. Suddenly the inhabitants of the outlying regions heard a muffled but persistent sound of thunder as the horses stampeded together in an attempt to storm the city. The cause was not discovered until later, however. At the time there was merely surprise at the unexpected sound coming out of the night's darkness, and no suspicion that an attack might be imminent. Since the pasture lands were within the city walls, nothing could contain the main assault, and since the horses also knew their masters' houses inside out, the destruction was devastating. It was an appalling night, yet only in the day's light was the full extent of its horrors revealed. Doors had been kicked down, and they lay shattered on the ground, offering no obstacle to the hordes of frenzied horses pouring through in an unending stream. There was blood, for many citizens were crushed beneath the sharp hooves, or torn apart by the great flashing teeth of the raging beasts, and men's own weapons were turned against them to wreak destruction. The city was paralyzed by the surging mass, its skies darkened by the clouds of dust that it raised, and it was rent by a weird tumult in which cries of rage or of pain mingled with whinnyings as subtle as speech and the violent crashes of destruction. Strange and horrifying sounds which added to the visible terror of the onslaught. The ground trembled with the ceaseless pounding of the rebellious hooves, which, like a hurricane, grew and faded in intensity as frantic crowds of people rushed to and fro without purpose or clear direction. The horses plundered the fields of hemp and even the wine cellars. Some of the beasts, corrupted by luxurious living, had long coveted the latter, and their fury grew as they became intoxicated and maddened. Escape by sea was impossible, for the horses knew the purpose of the boats and barricaded the way to the harbor. Only the fortress itself remained safe, and from within its walls men began to plan a defense. They fired arrows at any horse which approached, and if it fell within reach they dragged it inside for food. Strange rumors spread amongst the cowering citizens that the attack had been intended as nothing more than a pillaging expedition, and that the horses had battered down the doors and broken into the chambers merely to try and adorn themselves with the sumptuous draperies, the jewelry, and the other finery that lay within. It was the resistance they met that had aroused their fury. Others whispered of unthinkable acts of rapine, of women set upon and crushed with bestial violence on their own beds. They told of a virtuous young noblewoman who, racked with tears, had managed to stammer out the tale of her vile experience before she broke down utterly. How she was awakened in the dim lamplight of her chamber by the foul, thick-lipped mouth of a black colt rubbing against hers, its lips curling with pleasure and revealing its loathsome teeth. How she cried out in sheer terror at the presence of an animal that had turned into a slavering beast, 
its eyes burning with an evil human gleam, full of lust, and how she was almost drowned in a sea of hot blood when the horse was run through by her servant's sword. They told of cruel and deliberate murders when mares gleefully bit their victims with the frenzy of she-devils as they crushed them with their hooves. They had slaughtered all the asses, but the mules had joined in the rebellion, mindlessly reveling in destruction for its own sake and taking a particular pleasure in cruelly tormenting and then trampling dogs. All the while the thunderous roar of the rampaging horses continued to shake the fortress, and the crashing sounds of the destruction grew louder. If the huddling citizens were to save their city from utter destruction, they must escape somehow, though their assailants' sheer power and strength and number made it impossibly dangerous. The men gathered their arms, but now they had had a taste of what they had craved, the horses launched another attack. A sudden silence preceded the assault. From the fortress the men could see the fearful army congregating, not without some confusion, in the hippodrome. This took the animals several hours, and when everything seemed ready, a sudden bout of prancing and a series of high-pitched neighings, the purpose of which was impossible to discern, threw the ranks into great disarray. The sun was already setting when the first charge came. It was, if one may use the term, no more than a demonstration, for the animals confined themselves to running past the fortress and returned riddled with arrows. They launched another attack from the furthest part of the city, and its impact on the city's defenses was enormous. The entire fortress reverberated beneath the storm of hooves, and its solid Doric ramparts were severely strained. This time the enemy was repulsed, but it very soon attacked again. Most destructive were the shod horses and mules, which fell by the dozen. But their numbers seemingly undiminished, they quickly closed their ranks in frantic rage. The worst thing was that some had managed to put on fighting armor, and the steel mesh blunted the arrows. Others wore gaudy strips of cloth, others necklaces, and childlike in their very fury they would burst into unexpected frolics. Some of them were recognized from the ramparts. Diony, Aidan, Amalthea, Xanthi. They greeted the men with joyous whinnies, arching their tails, then immediately charging at them with fiery jerks. One of them, obviously a leader, stood straight up on his hocks and walked some way like this, gracefully waving his forelegs in the air, as if he were dancing a military two-step, and writhing his neck with snake-like elegance, until an arrow pierced his chest. Meanwhile the attack was succeeding. The fortress walls were beginning to yield. Suddenly an alarm paralyzed the beast. Using each other's rumps and backs for support, they raised themselves one above the other and stretched out their necks to peer at the poplar grove that grew along the banks of the Cassinides, and when the defenders turned to look in the same direction, a fearful sight met their eyes. Towering above the dark trees, horrifying against the early evening sky, the colossal head of a lion gazed towards the city. It was one of those wild prehistoric beasts which, although gradually dying out, still occasionally devastated the Rodolphe Mountains. But never had anything so monstrous been seen before, for the head soared above the tallest trees, the matted hair of its mane merging with the twilight-tinged leaves. They could see its enormous teeth gleaming brightly, its eyes half-closed against the light, its wild smell wafted towards them in the fitful breeze. Motionless against the trembling foliage, its gigantic mane glowing rusty red, shining like gold in the setting sun. It rose on the horizon like one of those boulders upon which Pelasgian, as old as the mountains, carved his savage deities. And suddenly it began to walk, as slowly as the ocean. You could hear the foliage being forced apart beneath its chest and its bellow-like breathing, which undoubtedly would soon turn into a roar, making the whole city tremble with fear. Despite their prodigious strength and numbers, the insurgent horses were unable to endure the presence of such a beast. In one thrust, they rushed to the beach, where they headed towards Macedonia, raising a storm of sand and foam as many disappeared beneath the waves. 
in the fortress panic reigned. What could they do against such an enemy? What bronze door hinge could resist its jaws? What wall could withstand its huge claws? They were already beginning to prefer past dangers. It had, after all, been a fight against civilized animals, too exhausted to even reload their bows when the monster emerged from the trees. Yet a roar did not break from its jaws. Instead came a human war cry, the aggressive, Hello! of battle, and in reply came the triumphant, joyous cries of, Hail! and hip hurrah from the fortress. Oh, wondrous miracle! Beneath the feline head the face of a deity, lit from above, appeared, and it blended magnificently with his honey-colored skin, his marble chest, his arms of oak, and his splendid muscles. And a cry, a concerted cry of freedom, of gratitude, of pride, filled the evening air. It is Hercules! Hercules is coming! <laughs>